I'm a historian by training, and in a previous career I wrote a biography of King Edward VII, a monarch whose admirable commitment to public health has always been rather obscured by his far more newsworthy commitment to his female companions. But I'm delighted that we're launching this report at the institution whose foundation in 1897 he initiated when he was Prince of Wales, and which has continued to bear his name as the King's Fund. Edward was born a Victorian at a time when, for many of his contemporaries, public health was an issue of increasing concern. They approached it with characteristic determination in different areas, nursing, clean air, drains and gardens. A few years after his birth in 1841, Joseph Paxton launched a public health revolution when he designed and laid out Birkenhead Park, Set in the rapidly expanding sprawl of Liverpool and Merseyside, it was the first publicly accessible urban park or garden anywhere in the world, and it gave birth to a series of parks and gardens in the cities of Victorian England, which remain a proud highlight of our urban planning. Crucially, Birkenhead's key motivation was not landscape design or horticulture, it was public health. The idea that access to green space and the opportunity to enjoy flowers would be of positive benefit to the urban population, many of whom were living in conditions of lightless squalor, was in its infancy, but it was built on a tradition of the benefits of gardens that stretched back for centuries. Since then, much has been done to expand on the work of those pioneering Victorians, and especially in recent years, the benefits that people have sought to offer in publicly available spaces have been developed in a huge variety of garden settings and for a wide range of audiences. Today, individual projects are focused on the help, recovery and rehabilitation that access to gardens can offer to people with mental and emotional illness, as we've heard, to veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan whose lives have been shattered by injury or PTSD or both. Maggie centres have gardens as an integral part of their philosophy and central to the, what they can offer to cancer sufferers. Similarly, Horatio's garden is beginning to offer revolutionary change to people struck down by spinal injuries with gardens adjacent to their specialist units. And the charity Thrive has for many years done pioneering work in developing social and therapeutic horticulture the process of using plants and gardens to improve physical and mental health. But the benefits that gardens have to offer to people's health and well-being are often being developed in isolated pockets. What is needed is a sense of coordination is that, so that they're all part of something with a common purpose. There is currently no central public health policy binding the activities together and leading by example, encouragement and investment. I would hope that development of such a policy would become the long-term outcome of our report. And when it is achieved, it will be the platform that really enables gardens to contribute to our national health care priorities. The National Garden Scheme was founded nearly 90 years ago, in 1927, specifically to raise funds for district nurses. It grew out of the origins of community nursing as founded by Florence Nightingale and William Rathbone in the 1860s. Their movement was formally recognised as part of the celebration of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. After Victoria's death in 1901, her daughter-in-law Alexandra, married to Edward VII, became their patron and it was a fundraising exercise for a memorial fund after her death in 1925 that led to the foundation of the NGS. A trustee of the Nursing Institute suggested that they could raise a lot of money for the, for the appeal by asking people, mostly pretty grand people, with large gardens around their country houses, to open their gardens to visitors and charge a modest entrance fee. In the summer of 1927, 600 gardens opened. They all charged one shilling admission and they raised a total of £8,000. In 2015, by which time the scheme had raised and given away nearly £50 million, some 3,800 gardens opened and raised well over £3 million. But in the early years, the access to gardens that the scheme offered was not just about fundraising. 
it was about initiating some social equality and demonstrating the benefits of access to gardens. Previously, unrestricted access to all had only really been offered by the public parks and gardens in the years after Birkenhead. Now, on certain days, entry to a large group of private gardens was for anyone, regardless of their social rank, as long as they paid their modest contribution to charity. It was a small but significant milestone, and it was picked up in the coverage in The Times the very day after the first opening on Whitson Bank holiday in 1927, when the paper wrote, Among the gardens that one could visit yesterday were those of Hatfield House. Those who went to Hatfield by motor car were allowed to drive through the gates right up to the house, and having paid a shilling to a boy at a table, could wander where they liked. It was pretty unusual in the 1920s. The scheme remained part of the Queen's Nursing Institute up until 1980, when it was set up as an independent charity. While it was no longer part of a nursing charity, the support of nursing remained its raison d'etre, and so when the decision was taken to expand the group of charities to which funds raised were donated annually, they were all and remain all nursing and caring charities. They remain the scheme's main beneficiaries, and in addition to the QNI, they include Macmillan, Marie Curie, Hospice UK, and Carers Trust. The cumulative effect of the annual donations to these charities means that for each one, the NGS is their largest single funder. Our long association with this group of expert nursing and caring charities alongside the wealth of insights and experience that we have accumulated from the thousands of people who have opened their gardens, put us in a unique position to promote the benefits of gardens and what they can offer to people's, to everybody's health and well-being. We've seen firsthand, working with Marie Curie and Hospice UK, the integral place, as Michael was saying, that gardens have in the planning and design of a modern hospice. And we've worked with Macmillan on a programme encouraging gardening as an activity for people recovering from long-term cancer treatment. Last year, to formalise our commitment to promoting the links between gardens and health, we announced a new category in our annual donations programme, which will always give a donation to a charity whose work focuses on these links. And the first one this year is Horatio's Garden. I came to the subject of gardens and health with a very personal perspective. Throughout my career, I have observed and written about gardens, the people who made them and the people who live in them. And the longer I've done it, the less interested I've become in what they look like and what grows in them, and the more interested in their relationship with people, the benefits that they offer and the impact on people's lives. It's been a rewarding journey. Along the way, I've had a series of what you might call mini Damascene moments, which have profoundly influenced my understanding of what gardens can offer. And I, I'm just going to tell you about three of them. Probably the first came in 1976, when, aged 13, my younger brother suffered a life-threatening accident. For weeks afterwards, he was in the paediatric intensive care unit of our local hospital in Canterbury. Immediately outside the unit, there was a very small patch of semi-enclosed lawn with a small seat, a cherry tree, and a selection of very resilient shrubs. During the many hours that we spent there, I remember being struck by the fact that although only really a garden by name, the parents and families of the children, whose lives in some cases were hanging by a thread, were naturally drawn to this small, tranquil space where they could sit in silence, or the parents could stand together chatting quietly, gathering resilience. Another episode came when I was the gardening correspondent of the Times paper in the 1990s, when for a number of years I accompanied the judges to one of the finalists for the Windlesham Trophy, which will touch on something that Dave mentioned, gardens in prisons. It was a prize for prison gardens founded by Lord Windlesham in the 1980s, when he was chairman of the parole board. His early inquiries confirmed that gardening was probably the most popular, rewarding and recuperative activity for prisoners, and so he initiated this annual competition. 
I visited a number of prisons and was fascinated by the miracles that were wrought with plants in settings nothing more, frankly, than concrete jungles, as well as the commitment and pride that came from making the gardens and becoming a finalist in the competition. And finally, most recently, last year, I visited the garden at Annick in Northumberland, where far more than the famous water cascade, the thing I most admired was a project they'd just started called Elderberries. It's a gardening club where elderly single men, many of whom have recently lost their life partner and who have no network of friends or family nearby for support, can go to alleviate the chronic illness that blights their lives. So whether grieving parents, disturbed prisoners or lonely old men, all have discovered that gardens were able to offer transformational support. For me, the key word here is solace and it gets to the heart of what gardens offer our health and well-being. And it's what I think of as the iceberg effect. Healthcare traditionally focuses on visible symptoms, things that can be diagnosed and treated with prescriptions or procedures. But for many people, this is only the tip of the iceberg, and it's what lies beneath that is so often the key to our health and well-being. Prince Harry referred to it just the other day, when opening the second Invictus Games, and he, I thought, captured it brilliantly with his phrase, invisible injuries. And in many instances, it's this what is a, gardens are able to offer people a, unseen conditions, and this is the key to their importance for healthcare. I'm going to end on what might seem a rather sombre note. But at the same time, it encapsulates all the hope, the optimism and the sense of purpose that are, for me, at the heart of what gardens can offer. Last week, the cause of gardens and health lost one of its most elegant and eloquent advocates with the death of Sally Brampton, amongst the most charismatic journalists of my generation. Sally suffered from severe depression but she was also a devoted gardener and the deep solace that she drew from her garden was the inspiration for her most memorable writing, much of which goes right to the heart of the instinctive, unfailing importance of gardens to all of us. And these are just a couple of short passages that she wrote. I am, you might have guessed, a passionate gardener, constantly amazed that a few bulbs planted in a pot should bring such beauty. A little love and attention is rewarded with extraordinary generosity. When I was very ill, I made a garden. It was a gloomy space overrun with brambles and darkened with neglect, but slowly, as slowly as I did, it came back to life until it was a place of sunshine and beauty. There was a tree at the end of the garden. There were times when it looked as miserable as I felt, but I held on to the thought that one day it would blossom. And it always did. If we need to be reminded of a small miracle, it is surely that. There is always hope and the never-ending certainty that one day spring will come. It may seem a long time coming, but I do know with absolute certainty that it will. Sally was a very special advocate of the health benefits of gardens, and there are others. But what they currently lack today is active coordination, so that in Aristotle's words, the, re the whole really can be greater than the sum of the parts. And I hope that our report will prove to be the foundation stone for this to be developed in future coming years. When my children are my age, I would like to think that for certain health conditions, it would be as likely for their GP to say, join our gardening club, as I'm prescribing you these pills that the integration of gardens into the planning, design and maintenance of hospitals will be as much of a priority as it is today for hospices, and that both public and private parks and gardens are seen are as an integral resource for social care and well-being in local communities. Then we will have a public health policy that integrates gardens in a way that emulates and improves on the example of our Victorian predecessors. The National Garden Scheme will continue to take as active as a lead as possible in bringing this about. And it was very important for us to commission a report that was independent so as to have something of complete integrity that would combine with the King's Fund's preeminent reputation in this area. 
So, Minister, thank you very much for giving up time to be with us today. Dave, thank you for compiling and writing the report in such masterly fashion. And I'd just like to say very special thanks to Sam, to Crystal Oldman and to Jane Collins for their help in all the work's gone into the preparation for this event and the report. Thank you for being with us today. Don't rush off. We'll talk more. There's coffee. Thank you.